First John chapter 4 is a verse that they uh, hang up on. And these people, they're like all the other cults. They don't believe in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as being good news for anybody. Uh, they don't believe in a real place called hell. They don't believe in a real place called heaven. Uh, they just believe your mind's everything, and they make big ado over the mind. And, uh, of course, in the Bible, the mind, something has to be guarded very carefully. Uh, what you have, you have a situation there as far as the mind's concerned where a lost person, their mind and their conscience is defiled. And a saved person, uh, you, uh, the devil, he's got access to two things. And it's not your soul and your spirit. They're safe and they're born again. He's got access to your mind and he's got access to your flesh. Flesh and the mind, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 and verse number 3. So those are things you've got to be careful for. And these people, uh, they hang up upon the mind. First John chapter 4, verse number 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, because perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. And verse number 18, a Christian science will read the verse, as uh, though there's no hell... No judgment, no nothing, no sin, don't have to worry about anything, uh, because uh, a loving father, he certainly would not uh, cause you or want you to fear anything, and there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. And, of course, that doesn't have anything to do with the fact there uh, that uh, uh, no, no judgment, that's not even a statement. Verse before speaks about a judgment. And, of course, he's not saying that we don't fear because there is no judgment. Uh, he's saying we don't fear because we've got an advocate uh, and somebody who's propitiation for our sins, like read in chapter 2, verse 1, verse number 2. The Christian science movement is a movement that's uh, it's, it's a cult, definitely a cult. And uh, it's pretty wild stuff. Not going to study everything about it, but we'll study some things about it. Uh, in every cult that you study, you, there's no end to how far you can go. There's no, no end how wild they really are. Pretty wild stuff connected with everyone. Almost unbelievable. You just can't hardly fathom that folks could believe certain things. And Christian science is no different. I know some of y'all in the study of the cults now, you're anxious to get to JWs because that's what you run into most of the time. We began with Mormons, and they're pretty prominent these days. I went on to Seventh-day Adventists, and they are uh, got a little bit of something going. And Christian science has a little less going than any of them. And yet, uh, just taking things historically now, uh, Christian science as far as time-wise, and coming through from uh, 1820 or 30 with the Mormonism in 1840, early 1840s, there in the middle of 1840s, Seventh-day Adventists, now you move up to 1866, 1867, and 70 type of range, and then you pick up the JWs later on near to 1880. So Christian science will be the study uh, this evening and probably next Sunday night as well. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we go any further. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you once again, Lord, on behalf of the material here that's here, and Lord, the material needs put out, and Lord, I, I need you, Lord, to put the put something upon it, Lord, so it'd be at least uh, relatively interesting to those that are here. And Lord, I know that it's a drag for me to even deal with this kind of stuff, but Lord, it's important. Lord, I want the people just partly armed, and I want a, an area where the devil can work on them, and God, I want them armed all the way. And Lord, I just ask that you might uh, help me, Lord, as I deliver the material now. And Lord, make it go easy, easy enough, well enough, Lord, so they can uh, get something to help them out. And Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for the fact they've come through this evening. And Lord, some have not come, but these have. Lord, I pray your blessing upon them for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Christian Science. Now, the name identifies them as a bunch of hypocrites. And the reason uh, the name identifies them as hypocrites because uh, they don't believe things that Christians believe. The major things that all Christians believe, Christian Science does not believe. For example, uh, Christian science doesn't believe in the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's their statement, Science and Health, page number 25. The material blood of Jesus Christ was no more efficacious to cleanse from sin when it was shed upon the accursed tree than when it was flowing in his veins as he went daily about his father's business. That's not true. That's directly in opposition to the Word of God. So whenever they call themselves Christian, they're just, they're, just a, they're lying. They're lying right through their teeth. They're not even remotely close to being Christians. Take your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 26, and look at verse number 28. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. 
The shedding of blood is very, very important. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is talking. In Matthew chapter 26, it's the Last Supper. In verse number 28, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed, shed. Underline that, shed for many for the remission of sins. In the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22, it says that it takes the blood for the remission of sins, just like the Lord Jesus Christ said. And the Bible says, Without shedding of blood is no remission. And so whenever they talk about the blood of Jesus Christ not being important, they make a difference whether they died on the cross or didn't die on the cross. Uh, they're not telling you the truth. And what they're doing is denying the major thing that you and I believe to be very, very important. You and I, we've got to know that we have no message. We have no salvation. We've got no hope for anybody outside the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing over and over again down the street corner, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. And it had to be shed. Again, some things that uh, we, you and I believe that they do not believe. They don't believe in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what they say. And they say Jesus was not dead when they took him down from the cross. Not true. John chapter 19. He let the people think that he was dead, but in reality, uh, was he a hoax or, or are they a hoax? I'd say that Jesus Christ is, like he said, the way, the truth, and the life. And these people are a hoax and a lie. Uh, he was not dead, but in reality, he was only pretending to be dead. He was demonstrating the science of mind. Here we go. Or the claims of matter in the tomb for three days. Hence, Jesus never having died, it was unnecessary for him to rise from the dead. Besides, Jesus neither rose nor ascended. His body evaporated into nothing. What about that? The eternal Christ idea went where it was before. All right, the statement of those people is that Lord Jesus Christ was not real. His death was not real. His uh, resurrection was not real. When he came back and said, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have, he was lying. And uh, they're saying it was not real. Those people deny the major truths of Bible-believing Christianity. He did die. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Take your Bible. Look at Acts chapter 2. Notice Peter, the, uh, after the resurrection, gets doing some preaching. Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 32. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up. You and I believe in a bodily resurrection, and the Bible says that's Peter's message there. Acts chapter 2, verse number 32. Uh, this Jesus hath God raised up where we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Oh, that's something sure, and that is that God raised him up. He did die. He was buried. He did come back the third day according to the scriptures, just like you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter says it was a fact. In the Bible, you take the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4 and verse number 25. The Bible says that he died for our offenses and he raised again for our justification. So what you and I believe in, they deny. And that being true, uh, those people bunch of I mean, they're a bunch of phonies to even call themselves anything remotely connected with Christianity. There's a man by the name of George Channing. He's an international lecturer for the Christian Science Movement. And uh, people ask him a bunch of questions in relation to what they believe. And, of course, they ask the question to him, do, do Christian Science believe in heaven or hell? And he said, yes, but. Whenever somebody says yes, but to you, hold still, man. <laughs> the answer is not yes, the answer is no. And he says, yes, but. Not in a geographical sense. Uh, then, of course, if not in a geographical sense, then well, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, if uh, hell is just a figment of our imagination, heaven is too, then it doesn't really matter. Nothing matters whether, you know, Jesus Christ preaches hell fire, you, you and I preach hell fire, it doesn't make any difference. If it's just something in our mind, it doesn't matter. If there's no geographical place, if there's not an actual location of a place called hell, it doesn't make any difference how hard somebody preaches. It's really immaterial. And he says, yes, but, not in a geographical sense, as Mrs. Eddy has said, the sinner makes his own hell by doing evil, the saint makes his own heaven by doing right. Call themselves Christian and deny the blood atonement of the death of Jesus Christ, one effectual sacrifice for sinners. Another statement, one sacrifice, however great, is insufficient to pay the debt of sin. Is that right? Ho oh, oh. ho. The atonement requires constant self-immolation on the sinner's part. 
You know what that does? That contradicts Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 10, 11, 12, 13, and verse number 14. A contradiction to the Word of God. They're not Christian. Uh, they're a bunch of lost people. They're a bunch of people going to hell. And they're not even scientific. I guess you know, whenever somebody talks about science, they're using a term that as a rule is connected with something you can measure, something with the physical in the physical realm, and they deny things uh, dealing with the physical realm. And, you know, someone like myself, they feel like, you know, no real body. Still there. <laughs> no soul, no, no body. And to them, it's just, uh, you know, something that uh, they talk about the mind and the idea. And it's kind of a type of a philosophy. And nothing Christian, nothing scientific about it. It appeals to the mind of bright people. It appeals to the mind of, uh, you take the initial bright boy. The initial bright boy in the Bible, Ezekiel chapter number 28, had to do with the devil. And somebody who has a little bit of intellect... Uh, they kind of have a tendency to think they're somebody, have a tendency to think more highly of themselves than what they ought to think, have a tendency sometimes even to worship their mind. And every lost person, no matter what his IQ is, no matter how smart he or she may be, their mind and their conscience are defiled. Titus chapter 1 verse number 15. But these people, because they speak about mine, 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 they appeal to intellectual type of a crowd. I don't think I really care to appeal to that kind of a crowd. That kind of a crowd, I, I like the common folk. It's the common folk that heard Jesus gladly, and the intellectual crowd usually not going to hear too much you've got to say from the Word of God. So the God of the Christian science is simply mine. I read this little uh, booklet here. It's called The Christian Science Sentinel, and that is in about, uh, let's see, January of 81. And uh, it talks about uh, being more obedient to minds. Where we capitalize G, they capitalize mind, M-I-N-D, mind's direction. And I notice this little book here, it talks more and more about it. Uh, holiness and identity come from mind, not the mind, but mind. Personification, like as though God is mind. Uh, then it says, because there's only one mind, we say one God, they say one mind, all capitalized. Uh, there's only one power and omnipotence, and on it goes. And uh, then it goes on just talking about mind, mind, and more mind. A bunch of wild stuff, but that's kind of how they feel about it. And what they do, and uh, they say that Jesus Christ is simply an idea of the infinite mind. An idea. He's just an idea, and thereby they deny and try to overthrow the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You deal with lost people who are neither Christian nor scientific. Now the founder. Uh, we call uh, this bunch of people a bunch of hypocrites, and that's because the founder, she was a hypocrite. Her hypocrite. Her name, Mary Baker. Her dad was a staunch Calvinist. She married a fellow by the name of Glover. He died, left her penniless and pregnant. She marries a man by the name of Patterson. He was a dentist and evident, eventually divorced her, and she goes third time around. Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddie. Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddie. She's a big old hypocrite. You say, well, she got married, her husband died. I ain't talking about it because of that. I'm talking about some important things, uh, why I call her a big old hypocrite. Now, she lived from 1821 to 1910. She had a long life. You say, why did God live somebody, let God live long, somebody like that? Why would someone like that have a long life? And here's somebody who tries to do right and live right, and they're saved, and they go out at 40 and 45 years of age. That's just the mercy of God. That's the mercy of God, I mean, being extended. That's the, that's a God who suffers long. One of his attributes being that he suffers long and puts up with somebody like this. And, you know, you think the first time somebody, uh, pulled off some of the shots she pulled off, made some of the comments that she made. You'd think that God would just take her and tumble her right straight on headlong into hell. But God didn't do it. God gave her a long time to get right. She never did get right. Mercy of God. But nonetheless, she still died and she went to hell. And I'll tell you why I say that later on. Uh, for example, statement she made, if there never existed such a person as the Galilean prophet, it'll make no difference to me. That's in her writings, and that's uh, some of her miscellaneous writings, page 318, page 319. You know what that is? That's a statement of a lost person. Never existed such a person as a Galilean prophet. I mean, would you have any hope? Would I have any hope? Outside Jesus Christ, is there any hope? She says to her, it doesn't make any difference. Evidently, then, she didn't trust him to be her personal savior. So she's a hypocrite, even to call herself Christian whatsoever. And she got involved with a fellow by the name of P. Phineas Quimby in Portland, Maine, in 1862. Uh, this fellow, he was a mesmerist, whatever they are. What's a mesmerist? 
hypnotist. <laughs> okay, he's a mental healer as well. And he was a clockmaker as well, and he got involved in hypnosis. That's your mesmerism. And uh, he, he got fooling around with hip, hypnosis and that sort of thing. And I guess he got, you know, making them clocks and fooling with those clocks and watching that thing go... Till finally he got Google-eyed, and all of a sudden his eye, her eyes began, or his eyes began popping out, you know, and all of a sudden, man, he got himself in a passive state going... The clock stopped, and he's still going. <laughs> Crazy stuff, you know. And uh, got pulled around with that sort of thing, and uh, hypnosis. And uh, maybe he didn't get it from watching pendulums, but he got fooling with it anyhow. <laughs> that probably would do it. Uh, but you know, whenever you get hypnotized, that puts you in a, a passive state. And when you're in a passive state, you're helpless. They ask you questions, and you know, whatever comes out, comes out. And you don't ever want to get in a situation like that. You always want to be alert. That's why rest is important. That's why it's it's important for you now to be on top of things and stay on top of things. Because if you get in a passive state, you might have something come into you and cause you all kind of trouble. And you could care less. I mean, you got no capacity to deal with anything. You can't sense anything. I mean, you're dull of hearing. You're dull as far as your senses are concerned. And you get in a passive state and demons come in. Luke chapter number 11. And you've got some problems. And evidently, P. Phineas Quimby had definite problems along those lines, and Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddy got fooled with this guy. And Quimby had a book called Science of the Christ. He had another called Science of Health. Hmm, sounds familiar. And she studied Quimby. And she'd get around him because uh, he was a mental healer. Evidently, she thought she needed some mental healing. She did. Uh, but she got around him and, and she'd go home at night and things that he'd put upon her, I mean, she'd get writing those things down. And Quimby died in 1866. Lo and behold, 1866, she made a discovery. He kicks off and she discovers what she calls the divine laws of life and truth and love. And she calls them Christian science. I said, she's a hypocrite. She's definitely a hypocrite. In 1875, she put out a book, Science and Health. You say, Quimby had a book like that. He did. Science of the Christ, and then gave it another name, Science of Health. And she says Science and Health. She stole his title and she copied, which is known as plagiarism? Plagiarism. Plagiarism. There you go. We're going to learn something tonight. Plagiarism. And you remind me about that next time. You know, once it's locked in as plagiarism... Hard to get plagiarism out of it. <laughs> but it's plagiarism. And she copied verbatim three sentences. Well, that's nothing. You always quote somebody. You quoted a couple of guys this morning. You said what Brother McGee said. And you said that uh, Brother Munn told you to turn your feet up for five minutes every Sunday afternoon at least. <laughs> and I did. Didn't sleep, but I turned them up. And, and uh, I tried to sleep, but couldn't sleep. And I got them turned up. Well, uh, she uh, quoted verbatim, copied verbatim. Not a couple of three quotations, 33 pages. 33 pages, word for word, from the book by P. Phineas Quimby. And you say, well, long, nothing wrong as long as she quotes it. That's true. As long as she gives credit where credit's due, nothing wrong with it. Uh, I do it all the time. But she did not give credit where credit was due. She's a thief. She stole his material. And she said it was her material, she stole his title, she copied 33 pages verbatim and put them in her book, and on top of that, took the substance of 100 pages in a book by Francis Lieber on Hegel's philosophy, and then she lied about that and said she didn't steal that. And here's her claim. No human pen or tongue taught me the science contained in this book. I was only a scribe echoing the harmonies of heaven in divine metaphysics. She's a liar, and she's a thief. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if that woman didn't steal directly from P. Phineas Quimby, and didn't steal from Francis Lieber and his work on Hegel's philosophy, then the only thing left for her, if what she said is true, and she's not a liar, there's one thing left. She had the wrong spirit. She had a bad spirit. She had a spirit. Uh, Spirit that in the Bible be known as a familiar spirit. She had a spirit that evidently Quimby, the mental healer and hypnosis man, had. That would have to be a satanic spirit. 
And evidently she was familiar with that spirit. She either copied directly and lied about it, or if she did not lie, the only thing left for her was that she had a familiar spirit. And if she had a familiar spirit, the Bible says, Thou shalt not, well, the one at uh, Witch at Endor had one in First Samuel 28. And the Bible in the Old Testament said, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And the Bible says, The children of Israel, there is not to be a necromancer. Or there is not to be nobody with a familiar spirit, no wizard. There is not to be any of that kind of people among the tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. So, if she wasn't lying... She's got a bad spirit. One time I went to a meeting the Buddhists had in town at the YWCA. And I went there and I thought, well, now these people are going to have an argument. And they'll come close to convincing me that this reincarnation business, it, it's going to look real. And I better be thinking about the Word of God and I better be armed along those lines. And so I went there and nothing really was too impressive. But I remember that they made statements uh, that the, one of the reasons they go by re, or go for re, fall for reincarnation is that so-and-so died five years ago and said this. And here comes a little old, and wouldn't be anything scriptural, but made statement. And so here comes somebody that's born and uh, they're born and they, uh, oh, maybe they're five or ten years of age and they begin making a statement or 15 years of age, whatever. They make a statement that this person who died made. And so they said, now, this person that died, this little monkey, well, no, not a monkey, this person that, <laughs> this person that, uh, has been born now is a reincarnation of this person. And so they buy it along those lines. Why, that's not good thinking. Anybody that has any sense from the Bible knows better than that. Anybody knows that here somebody had a bad spirit over here, and that person died, and that flesh that they're so interested in became dust, and so that spirit's got to find another body to indwell. And so here's somebody who's helpless and in an environment be totally conducive to nothing but satanic spirits like you have Buddhism in some of those countries. And in a situation like that, here's a helpless little child, 5, 10, or 15 years of age, and that same spirit come, that came out of that demon-possessed person that died comes right into this person here and uses the same vocab and the same pitch and the same language and the same speech and the same talk and the same words. And somebody says, he's a reincarnation of the one that died. It's just the same familiar demoniac spirit. And if that's true, if she did not lie, that's all it amounted to for her. She's a hypocrite to even use someone's material like that. If they'd have called her attention to it, like they did, she should have examined the material and said, I don't know how that ever happened, uh, but uh, the material does match. And I renounce my writings. He had the material, number one and first of all. Uh, the whole movement is filled with hypocrites. Because their leader is a hypocrite. She's called the revelator of truth to this age. Doesn't that sound familiar? Every time you study a call, it's like nobody had any truth. Here we come for 1,800 years on this side of Calvary. Nobody had any truth. And Mormons was the same way. I mean, from 400 up until 1,800, no truth. Christian science, they're the one true remnant church. Uh, now, here we are, Christian... Uh, Seventh-day Adventist. Here we are with Christian science now, and she's called the revelator of truth to this age. She brought with her the comforter Jesus foretold. Well, what do you know about that? As far as I'm concerned, I mean, she's a little on the late side. The comforter came, according to the Bible, in Acts chapter number 2. And so she's uh, uh, very, very extremely late to be bringing the comforter to this earth, and her now being the revelator of the truth. She now offers, here's a statement by their own man, international lecturer, Christian science movement, George Channing. She now offers the complete spiritual meaning of the Bible. Never had it before. When Jesus said when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. Jesus was not telling the truth. He came in Acts chapter 2. Nobody had the truth for 1,800 years. And now she comes and she's going to guide them into all truth. The full meaning to them would not have been available without Mrs. Eddy's discovery, which makes her the Holy Spirit himself. Romans 8 better change that thing to herself. I mean, that's what the bottom line of that thing is when you measure it on. Here's a bunch of people say nobody gets sick, nobody has any problems that way, it's all in your mind. And she went to a dentist. 
And she wore specs. You say, well, what kind of specs? These kind. Uh, she wore glasses. She used morphine as well. And she died a millionaire. A millionaire these days is not all that much. The man it is to me. Well, I mean, just judging by the what you read in newspapers and general trend, there's probably 4,000 of them in our country. At least paper millionaires. On paper, they're a millionaire. They may have $100,000 cash or, or something like that. They're a paper millionaire. They might have a building that's worth $100,000. They say it's worth a million dollars. Man, look at our assets worth a million dollars. And uh, along those particular lines, there's probably thousands of them. But in 1875 and 1900, a millionaire was worth some shekels. Silver's worth silver, gold's worth gold, and she died a millionaire. She's a hypocrite, by a bigger hypocrite is what the Papa in Italy is. I mean, uh, talk about poverty while they live uh, right in the middle of diamonds, gold, and silver. Now, this woman here, she had a bunch of hypocrites with her. And uh, this uh, woman, she had, uh, we'll call them uh, her and her hands, they're all hypocrites. And she's a hypocrite because, about, amongst other things, She's the first pastor of the first church of Christ Scientist, 1879. 1866, Quimby kicks off. She begins to write. Aha, man, I discovered something. She lies. She just picks up what he had to say. And she goes on and finally publishes, publishes a thing in 1875. And in 1879, uh, she is the founder and pastor, Mrs. Pastor, the first church of Christ Scientist, and she calls it the Mother Church. Well, I guess they should call it the Mother Church. <laughs> it's her church. I mean, it wouldn't be the Father Church. And <laughs> they're all the Holy Mother Church. And here she is. Uh, she's, uh, she's the head of the Mother Church. I'll read you something here from page 52 out of the Sentinel. Mrs. Eddy include the following instructions in the manual of the Mother Church. No members should use written formulas, nor permit his patients or pupils to use them as auxiliaries to teaching Christian science or for healing the sick. She did. She used everybody else's material. They're not allowed to. Whatever is requisite for either is contained in the books of the discoverer and founder of Christian science. That is anything you need, I put down, she says. Sometimes she may strengthen the faith by written text as no one else can. That's in the instructions in the manual of the mother church. And so uh, people buy that kind of thing. In this particular publication on the back are a list of the ones that wrote in the uh, in this particular issue. And uh, this, oh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are nine writers here that wrote in this little publication. I guess probably a monthly publication. Volume 83, number 2, January 12, 1981. And uh, these writers are, number one, Laura Haddock. Laura, like Lori? As far as I know, it's a female name. Don't let arson steal your home. Rosalie Dunbar. That's a lady. Inspired treatment. Nora Shaw. Nora. That's a lady's name. Right? Am I right? Nora. That's not a man's name. Norval. That's a man's name. Nora is a woman's name. Taming the Incredible Hulk of Anger, Carolyn Sh Swan. No, that's a woman's name. A Safe Harbor, Irene Lodge. No, that's a woman's name. A Glimpse of Love, Diana Woods. No, that's a woman's name. Spiritual Soldering, William Welsh Hall, and that's a man. All right, there's eight of them. Seven out of eight are women that write in the publication. Uh, last one, Washing Feet versus Washing Hands, Barbara, that's a woman's name, Barbara Audrey Morse. And then uh, another one. For children, finding Tiki, Mary Mona Seed Fisher. About one more time and she'll be caught up with her uh, mother, church leader there. Anyhow, eight of the nine writers are women. And she said she was called to God as Samuel was. Everybody's got to duplicate what goes on in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, or the exact replica of God's dealings with another person in the Bible. And that's not it. I mean, was Paul called of God? Did his call match Samuel's call? It did not. Doesn't the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 there are diversities of operation when it comes to the Holy Spirit of God? Diversities of ministrations, diversities of gifts. He works differently in different people. And so the call of the ministry 
As a rule, is going to be different. There will be some things similar, but God's going to deal with one man's heart differently than he deals with another man's heart. And she claims that her call was the same call as was Samuel's call. Trying to duplicate and give authority to her call, which if there's any call been to it, it definitely was not of the Lord. It might have been a call, but not the Lord. Take your Bible and look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. If somebody called her, she heard a voice that was not the still small voice of God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. All right, then this woman, she says she was called of God, and evidently the movement appeals very strongly, as far as I can see, when a publication consists out of eight out of nine or nine out of ten writers being women, the publication, uh, then evidently that's a strong tendency of women to be drawn into the movement. Now, it seems as though that the cults, uh, they, they can draw women like you would not believe. Uh, Linda, she tells me about somebody that they knew that they went to school with. And this is no reflection on the school because I know what the school teaches. But this woman now is in a Jehovah Witness movement. And she now is dead against Baptist people like you and I. She's dead against Bible salvation by the grace of God like you and I believe and preach and teach. And she is now propagating uh, Jehovah Witness material and that particular movement. It seems as though that women have a tendency to be suckered in more easily and readily than a man does. And therefore, they need the instruction of the man. And here's a woman leading the way, and she's got a bunch of little hens following her, and they're no better than what she is. Uh, another thing about this movement shows you it's neither Christian nor science. Her call is not a call of the Bible. Another thing... And that is the movement's strong point is healing. Healing suckers in the people. Uh, clear uh, back as, uh, well, it's recent, but back in 1982, they said they do not believe in doctors or hospitals. Do you? You say, well, I don't like them. I don't like them either. I don't even like to visit hospitals, but I do. Glad to go and minister to somebody best that I possibly can. But sometimes, you know, a hospital is a place to be. Sometimes you can go in a hospital and your life can be saved just because you've gone to the hospital and they've got some equipment there, they've got some uh, knowledge there that you would not have uh, in your home. In the Bible, you read about Luke the Beloved Physician, Colossians chapter 4. A man defined Christian science as, listen to it, a formula for health and wealth by right thinking. But he said this, it's thinking denies the reality of poverty and sickness. And they're like Norman Vincent Peale. You think everything's okay, and it's sure going to be okay. And you think that you're going to, you think big, and you're going you're gonna to make it big. And that may be okay to a point. I mean, devil will try to help you along those lines. He'd like you to get you to think big and stretch yourself. And get you out in the limb, way out in the limb somewhere, and then cut the limb off. Uh, that's the way the devil operates. And so they say that there is no such thing as sickness, and if there is anything, it's just here, and we gotta get that mind healed. Healing's the best known part of their movement, and the most effective way of winning con converts. And they use, for example, they speak about Jesus healing the sick to push their doctrine. But when Jesus healed the sick, he was healing somebody that had a physical problem. Sure, he healed the brokenhearted. But he also healed people that were impotent in their feet. He healed people who were uh, palsied. He took people that had physical infirmities and Jesus Christ healed them. But to the Christian science movement, their healing is to regenerate human thought. Just get our thinking straight that there is no real sickness and they call that healing and they sucker people in with anything connected with healing. All right, now another thing for them is that they were asked, do Christian science go to hospitals? 
Mr. Channing replied, they basically reject medical treatment. And the degree to which their, their religion, that they rely on material methods, shows a degree that they are not relying on Christian science. He was asked, do they refer medical, refuse medical attention when children are sick? He answered, basically yes. But no one is forced to rely on Christian science against what he calls his own good judgment. It's kind of now we're getting into a little bit of a foggy area. Now things get a little bit on the cloudy side. I had a friend of mine one time and I used to talk to him about certain things and, and he'd say, oh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, so you say this is sin? Well, who, who says it is? And he just kind of fell on to, you know, sin a lot and, they want to sin in certain areas and act like, well, after all, I mean, where do we get this idea of sin? But this particular fellow, his son-in-law worked out on the job as well. And he just sort of picked up those ideas because his wife was, she was involved in the Christian science movement. And so I asked him, I said, what about, you know, the children they were coming up to and they got sick. Did they go to the doctors. What happened to them? Because he was married to the daughter. He said that his wife told him that whenever she was growing up and her and the brothers and sisters got sick, the mother did not believe in taking the children to the doctors or hospitals. And so what the dad did, he pulled a little sneaky Pete job. And he just snuck them off to the doctors and got them treated and then brought them back home. And then the mother, she kept on pulling off her Christian science, you know, uh, praying business. And then she'd give testimony how her children got healed while the dad's sneaking them off to the doctors whenever they got sick. Now, maybe they don't all do that, but that's how this one worked out. Again, he was asked to Christian science calling the doctor a childbirth. And to that now, they said, yes. We make sure someone who possesses necessary skills is present. They asked him, said, have not some Christian science died because the doctor was called too late. And of course he said, now wait a minute, you can't judge us by the cases we lose. And he says, no more than you can judge the medical profession and hospitals uh, by how many people are in them and how many wind up in the graveyards. Well, that's kind of true. He sort of got them going there. And yet by the same token, there may be some that could have made it that were not given any treatment and the result was they went on and they went to an early grave. Now, they say the potentialities are this. Men and women with incurable diseases have spent years suffering and then turned to Christian science and got healed. That's their claim. They say that's the potential. Here's somebody needlessly suffering years upon years. If they just turn to us, maybe they get healed. It's happened a lot of times. That's the claim. Now, remember... Healing's always the great thing that suckers people in. If you're sick, you unhealed. The doctor can charge you an outlandish price because when you're sick, you want well. You'll go spend $30, $35 a week, sometimes $50 at a crack to a specialist because you want to get well. Uh, the Pentecostal movement's on its way, well on its way, because folks want healed. You say, well, tongues uh, as well. Healing and tongues, they kind of, uh, that's the two major things in a Pentecostal movement. Healing always is an enticement to folks that are sick and Christian science cashes in on that type of thing. They may be a little bit different than what others are in their approach than a Pentecostal would be or like Peter Popoff is in his approach. Uh, but still, they get a crowd and they get a following because they speak much about healing. He was asked, do they go for medical attention in case of fractures uh -oh, or accidents? And he said there have been innumerable cases where bone fractures have been set and perfectly healed, or healed perfectly, under Christian science. If it's true, and it's possible, if it's true, it reverts right back to a satanic uh, situation. It reverts back to a situation that, where you have evil spirits that are able to actually do some things on a physical standpoint, and it would go back to nothing from the Lord, but it would be the influence of Satan and the help of Satan that would come through for them. Take your Bible now and go to Revelation chapter 13, verse number 12. Revelation chapter 13. 
The Lord's not connecting this healing at all. But the devil is. Revelation 13, verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. There's a healing that takes place that the Lord is not even remotely, not remotely connected with. That's the devil, that's the Antichrist. The Lord is not in that thing at all, none whatsoever. Likewise, should there be such a thing, and it can be a possibility, it would have to fall into this category and this class where the Lord is not even connected with it, where a bone fracture is set and somebody is healed perfectly, that would be with the help of the devil himself. You say, why the devil help them? Why? Because, listen, here's a group that rejects the Trinity, rejects Calvary, rejects the blood atonement, the one effectual sacrifice, does not believe in heaven, does not believe in hell, and the result is, I mean, the devil, if he's going to help anybody, would be more than willing to help somebody like that. You and I, of course, we understand how ridiculous this type of thing is, how unscriptural and devilish this type of thing is. And you and I must always take a position, and this to me is the classic. I've mentioned it before, but one time Irv and I were speaking about somebody who had strong tendencies to move into the Pentecostal church. And they were told the truth and dealt with from the Bible. Urban summed it up real, real precise. He said, Brother Art says, real simple. He said, they just wanted healed more than they wanted the will of God. You know why this movement can get some people in? Because they want healed more than they want the will of God. They'd take healing if it came from the devil himself. Sometimes it's possible that way. You better do what the Bible says. I mean, seek to the Lord first of all. Uh, don't deny the fact that sometimes the doctors are beloved physicians. And sometimes, I mean, Paul had uh, Luke with him all the time. I mean, go to the Lord first and then to the physicians. Not to the doctors and hospitals first and then to the Lord, but to the Lord and then to the physicians and then to the doctors. It's kind of a bad and sorry movement, but they sucker people in because they profess to perform signs and wonders, but even though they may do it, that's no guarantee that their religion is from God. All right, let's take our Bibles and move through our Bibles a little bit. Go to Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 22. Matthew 7, verse number 22. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The capabilities of the devil are that he can pull off the supernatural, he can pull off miracles, signs, and wonders, and he can be transformed into a false apostle with all the signs of the apostles. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, or chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 13. For such are false apostles. All right, then the devil can take his followers and transform them into false apostles. They can do wonders. They can have the signs. They can do the miracles. He says they're false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're not. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing of his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. All right, now take your Bible and go to Exodus chapter 7. Book of Exodus now, and notice how it goes. You've got to be careful with healing. Exodus chapter 7 and verse number 11. Lord tells Moses, he says, you take that rod of yours. He says, stretch that thing out. And he says, that thing will become a, it'll become a serpent. Verse number 11. All right, uh, 10. Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and did the, they did so as the Lord had uh, commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants it became a serpent. That's a miracle. That's a sign. All right, 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men, the sorcerers. All right, now, sorcery. Uh, the wise men of Egypt. Magicians. Magic. All right, that's, that has to do with witchcraft. The magicians of Egypt, they also did like manner with their enchantments. 
they could do the same thing in verse 11 and 12 that Moses and Aaron were able to do. Look at verse 19. Verse number 19, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, stretch out thine hand, upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon the rivers, upon their ponds, upon their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that they may be there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did it so as the Lord commanded. You know the story, the waters of Egypt turned to blood. Number 22, the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. What Moses and Aaron could do, so could the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Look at chapter 8 and verse number 7, dealing with frogs. Now, and the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. All right, now, all of a sudden you hit a snag. Verse 18 and verse number 19. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. But the magicians finally hit a stumbling block and a stopping point. Nineteen, the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And of course the Lord comes through, and he puts boils upon them, and everybody gets pretty excited at that point. But needless to say, you and I have got to be real, real careful, uh, even along the lines of healing. And you need to make sure that you never fall for a moment or a second uh, into a movement that's against the Word of God just because they have testimonies to healing, profess healing, say they have the ability to healing. And this little booklet here, which is probably a one-month issue or less, there are six pages of testimonies to healings. And with that, people say, man, and read that type of thing month after month, and people are suckered in because of the healing movement. Our position is a Bible position to the Lord first, then to the physicians. Second Chronicles 16, verse number 12, Asa got in trouble because he, res- uh, he, he, uh, he reversed the Bible way of doing it. Paul had a beloved position with him, and even on the uh, ship that went on to Rome, uh, Luke was with him, writing uh, in Acts chapter 27, he says, We sailed, we, we, we. Luke was with him all the way to Rome. When I was young, I had a neighbor out in northeast end. It was Christian science. Not next door, but next to next door. Second house down the street. These people were Christian science. And I can't remember much about them. They were real nice people. And I can remember that whenever they got sick, everybody was kind of amazed because they didn't go to doctors. And back in those days, we thought doctors were everything. I did anyhow. Don't know if my folks did, but I did. And they didn't go to doctors. And so I was amazed. And I can remember one time, I said, where are they at? They were, somebody was real sick. Next thing you knew or heard, they got well. Wow, man, they didn't go to doctor, didn't go to hospital, and didn't go to the drugstore, and they got well. They got well. I went on for a couple of months or so, and next thing you know, they got sick. Say, oh, well, man, they don't need a doctor, they don't need a hospital, they don't need to go to the drugstore for any kind of medication at all, no antibiotics, don't need any penicillin. Man, they're going to get well again. And this time, they died. And next step after this, the judgment. Next step for someone like that, a devil's hell. You say they don't believe no heaven or hell. Well, stop and think. One time I was talking to a fellow and he got hung up on something that I am believe in, talking to him about three hours. and He began to tell me that Revelation chapter 20 was spiritual. The 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, no such thing. That's just figurative, that's spiritual. And I said, oh, if Revelation chapter 20 is spiritual, then uh, evidently Revelation 19 is. And so the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the battle of Armageddon, uh, nothing to it. That's just uh, spiritual. He's not actually coming again. I mean, if chapter 20 is spiritual, why wouldn't chapter 19 be spiritual? And on top of that, if chapter 20 is spiritual and chapter 19 is spiritual, then what about chapter 21? Chapter 21, New Jerusalem. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And I said, uh, if New Jerusalem's only spiritual, then, fella, you have really lost a lot. Whenever somebody takes New Jerusalem from you, 
And everybody thinks only in terms of hell. Man, I mean, it'd be wonderful if there was no hell. And so I like to believe there's no hell. But what about no new Jerusalem? No new heaven. What about that? Whatever you have lost that, you have lost a lot. And you know, the same thing is true of any religion. If Christian science, anyone, anyone that takes literal, actual New Jerusalem away from you and I, they have taken a lot from you. My friend, you lost a lot. And Christian science does that very thing. No such thing as heaven or hell. Like I said at the start. And all cults are that way. They don't believe in a Bible hell. I looked at a book over there and I meant to show you some stuff last time on Seventh-day Adventist that was sent to me from someone that Veron and somebody else had witnessed to. And uh, you need to it'd do you well to actually see the uh, mockery of a lake of fire. Armstrongism does the same thing. And I picked up a pamphlet this afternoon down in my office and I thought it was Seventh-day Adventist. When I looked at it, it says, is there a real Bible hell? Something along those lines. And then I looked the thing over and it was just a refuting of hell like Jesus preached it. Oh, this time it wasn't Seventh-day Adventist, it was Armstrongism, which is about nearly Seventh-day Adventism. But all the cults are that way. And you remember the statement by Channing, he said, yes, we believe in it, but. Not in a geographical sense, as Miss a- Mrs. Eddy said, the sinner makes his own hell, but doing evil, the saint makes his own heaven by doing right. You know what that is? It's double talk. You know who talks double talk? The one that has the cleft split tongue. You know the one that's double tongued? That's the devil. You know what you got? You got double talk there. We believe it. Uh Uh-uh. They don't believe it. They don't believe what Jesus Christ said about hell. They don't believe what Jesus Christ said about heaven. I mean, Jesus Christ said in John chapter number 14, He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place. Not an idea. A place. Not something to imagine. A place. Listen, I go and prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Revelation chapter 21, when he gets talking about new heaven and new earth, he says these words are true and faithful. And yet they deny that. It's double talk. They say, yes, but. When it comes to hell, Jesus Christ said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. A geographical location. What he do? His soul was not left in hell. He did go down to hell and dumped our sins there. That's where they belong. Say, where is it at? In the heart of the earth, like Jesus said. Where is it at? It's at the bottoms of the mountains. Just like the Bible says in the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 2, and verse number 6. Now, though they have testimony on testimony to healing, and though they have some pretty cute and slick talk, the movement is still satanic. Again, to check out their honesty and compare it with the Bible, there are more problems than just heaven or hell. An old-time preacher named Haldeman made a chart one time, and he had about 20 things that Christian science says that are against the Bible. I'll give you 13 of the boobs. Lies. They say there's no real matter. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Christian science says man is incapable of sin. The Bible says for all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christian science says man cannot depart from holiness. Tell me about it, will you? I'm a pastor. Just as a pastor, not even a policeman, just as a pastor... Just as a pastor, I have more tendency to believe that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Implying you don't even know the wickedness of your own heart as a saved person. Man cannot depart from holiness. Doesn't the Bible say all we like sheep have gone astray? We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christian science says Jesus didn't come to save from sin but from the sense of sin. What about that? 
And the Bible says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christian science says there's only one sacrifice, or one sacrifice, no matter how great, is insufficient. The Bible says, for by one sacrifice he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. They say the material blood of Jesus Christ was no more efficacious to cleanse from sin, and I gave you the rest of the statement earlier. No blood is needed. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, or through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins... Redemption, forgiveness of sins, is through His blood. Remission is through His blood. Reconciliation is through His blood. Justification is through His blood. And they said, no need of blood. One time, Mobile got witnessing to him and said, uh-uh, man, no slaughterhouse religion for me. I don't know about you, man, but I, I know the blood is needed, definitely needed. They say man is never sick. Doesn't the Bible say Jesus went about healing all those that were, were sick? They say there is no death. Yet the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. They say man is coexistent with God. Uh, the Bible says all flesh is as grass. It's going to flourish and pass away. Flower and pass away. They say resurrection was just a reappearance of an idea. Or in idea. Jesus said, Handle me and see, for spirit hath not flesh and uh, bones as you see me have. They say there's no final judgment. And yet Paul reasoned with them of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. It was discovered by a woman and taught by a man. And yet the Bible says that that woman is not to usurp authority over the man. They say, listen to this wild shot, the material record of the Bible is no more important to our well-being than the history of Europe and America. That's in the Miscellaneous Writings of Merritt Baker Eddy, page 170. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. When you check them out, you're dealing with a bunch of people that are dishonest people. They are no way are Christian whatsoever. Summation, a bunch of hell-bound hypocrites. So, oh, Brother Martin, how can you say that? No blood, no remission, no sin, just sense of sin. So if you don't believe you're sinning, then you never go to God to get your sins forgiven. As a matter of fact, Channing said, man is really sinless and free. Oh, wow. No sins, no judgment. Man doesn't believe in judgment. They're unprepared to meet God. Don't get prepared. Knowing there's a judgment out ahead. No Jesus Christ being God, he's an idea. Well, then why trust an idea to be your Savior? John chapter 8, they die in their sins. In relation to Jesus Christ, if you look in the back of science and health in the glossary in the back, there's more on Japheth, believe it or not, than on Jesus Christ. And you find that at the end of the Science and Health book. No Bible. Another wild statement. The literal rendering of the scriptures makes them nothing valuable, but often is the foundation of unbelief and hopelessness. The metaphysical rendering is health and peace. Believe it like we do. It's not literal. You people believe it's literal. You're hopeless. Believe like us. It's health and peace and hope for all. They're lost. You know why? That position is the position of a lost man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. No sin, it's just a dream. To the dreamer, it's real. The statements get wilder and wilder the further and further you go. But doesn't make any difference. Those folks that receive that particular line of teaching, that line of thought, worship the infinite mind and their mind, and the mind of Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddy. Whether Christ came to earth or not, she said, doesn't make any difference to me. She's in hell. Her followers are in hell. And 
anybody that receives to be the truth, that doctrine, will die not believing in a judgment, not believing they've got to have their sins forgiven, not believing in blood atonement to forgive those sins, not getting ready for the judgment bar of God, will die in their sins and go to a devil's hell and stay there and remain there and burn forever. And it'll be real, real fire, real flames, real torment, and a real hell forever. Norman Vincent Peale, I'll show you how wild things have gotten, said universal salvation is future when the idea of sin gradually dies. And Science and Health, page 593, they define salvation as by the casting out of the idea of sin. You can see where the liberal stands. You can see how that even Norman Vincent Peale is talking out of both sides of his mouth just as double-tongued to even call himself a Christian minister, as are the folks that call themselves Christian science. They're lost in their sins. Their sins remain unforgiven. Like anybody else, no matter what the tag is, they die and go to hell. They, fa they fancy themselves as being the great love movement. And you and I know that they're the great lost movement. And you and I, because of the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts, need to do our very best to try to be able to bring them to the Bible, confront them with the Bible, deal with them on the Bible, and win them to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the Holy Bible. Please bow for prayer.